Section 6. The Promise of Spring of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Only when the fields and roads are sufficiently dry will the favorable moment have come for an advance. Extract from Official Dispatch. It is Sunday, and the regiment marching out toward the firing line and its turn of duty in the trenches meets on the road every now and then a peasant woman on her way to church. Some of the women are young and pretty, some old and wrinkled and worn. They walk alone or in couples or threes, but all alike are dressed in black and all alike tramp slowly, dully, without spring to their step. Over them the sun shines in a blue sky, Round them the birds sing, and the trees and fields spread green and fresh. The flush of healthy spring is on the countryside. The promise of warm, full-blooded summer pulses in the air. But there is no hint of spring or summer in the sad-eyed faces, or the listless, slow movements of the women. It is a full dozen miles to the firing line, and to eye or ear, unless one knows where and how to look and listen, there is no sign of anything but peace and pleasant life in the surroundings. But these black-clad women do know, know that the cool green clump of trees over on the hillside hides a roofless ruin with fire-blackened walls, that the church spire that for all their lives they had seen out there over the skyline is no longer visible, because it lies shell-smitten to a tumbled heap of brick and stone and mortar that the glint of white wood and spot of scarlet yonder in the field is the rough wooden cross with a kepi on top marking the grave of a soldier of France, that down in the hollow just out of sight are over a score of those cap-crowned crosses, that a broad belt of those graves runs unbroken across the sunlit face of France. They know, too, that those dull booms that travel faintly to the ear are telling plain of more graves and of more women that will wear black. It is little wonder that there are few smiles to be seen on the faces of these women by the wayside. They have seen and heard the red wrath of war, not in the pictures of the illustrated papers, not in the cinema shows, not even by the word-of-mouth tales of chance men who have been in it, but at first hand with their own eyes and ears, in the leaping flames of burning homes, in the puffing white clouds of the shrapnel, the black spouting smoke of the high explosive, in the deafening thunder of the guns, the yelling shells, the crash of falling walls, the groans of wounded men, the screams of frightened children. Some of them may have seen the shattered hulks of men borne past on the sagging stretchers. All of them have seen the laden ambulance wagons and motors, crawling slowly back to the hospitals. And of these women you do not say, as you would of our women at home, that they may perhaps have friend or relation, a son, a brother, a husband, a lover, at the front. You say with certainty they have one or other of these, and may have all, that every man they know, of an age between, say, eighteen and forty, is serving his country in the field or in the workshops, and mostly in the field, if so be they are still alive to serve. The men in the marching khaki regiment know all these things, and there are respect and sympathy in the glances and the greetings that pass from them to the women. They are good pluck duns, they tell each other, and wonder how our women at home would shape at this game, and whether they would go on living in a house that was next door to one blown to pieces by a shell yesterday and keep on working in fields where hardly a day passed without a shell screaming overhead, whether they'd still go about their work as best they could for six days a week, and then to church on Sunday. Two women, one young and lissom, the other bent and frail, and clinging with her old arm to the erect figure beside her, stand aside close to the ditch and watch the regiment tramp by. "'Cheer up, mother,' one man calls. We're going to shift the bushes out for you. And bong jour, says another, waving his hand. Another pulls a sprig of lilac from his cap and thrusts it out as he passes. Souvenir, he says, lightly. And the young woman catches the blossom and draws herself up with her eyes sparkling and calls, Bon chance, monsieur. Good luck. 
She repeats the words over and over while the regiment passes, and the men answer, bong chance, and good luck. And such scraps of French as they know, or think they know. The women stand in the sunshine and watch them long after they have passed, and then turn slowly and move on to their church and their prayers. The regiment tramps on. It moves with the assured stamp and swing of men who know themselves and know their game, and have confidence in their strength and fitness. Their clothes are faded and weather-stained, their belts and straps and equipments chafed and worn, the woodwork of their rifles smooth of butt and shiny of hand-grip from much using and cleaning, their faces bronzed and weather-beaten, and with a dew of perspiration just damping their foreheads. Where men less fit would be streaming sweat, are full-cheeked and glowing with health, and cheek and chin razored clean and smooth as a guardsman's going on church parade. The whole regiment looks fresh and well set up and clean-cut, satisfied with the day and not bothering about the morrow, magnificently strong and healthy, carelessly content and happy, not anxious to go out of its way to find a fight, but impossible to move aside from its way by the fight that does find it. All of which is to say it looks exactly what it is, a British regiment of the regular line, war-hardened by eight or nine months' fighting, moving up from a four days' rest back into the firing line. It is fairly early in the day, and the sun, although it is bright enough to bring out the full colour of the green grass and trees, the yellow laburnum and the purple lilac, is not hot enough to make marching uncomfortable. The road, a main route between two towns, is paved with flat cobbles about the size of large bricks, and bordered mile after mile with tall poplars. There are farms and hamlets and villages strung close along the road, and round and about all these houses are women and children, and many men in khaki, a few dogs, some pigs perhaps, and near the farms plenty of poultry. By most of the farms, too, are orchards and fruit trees in blossom and in some of these lines of horses are ranked or wagons are parked, sheltered by the trees from aerial observation. For all this, it must be remembered, is far enough back from the firing line to be beyond the reach of any but the longest-range guns, guns so big that they are not likely to waste some tons of shells on the off chance of hitting an encampment and disabling few or many horses or wagons. Toward noon, the regiment swings off the road and halts in a large orchard. Rifles are stood aside, equipments and packs are thrown off, tunics unbuttoned and flung open or off, and the men drop with puffing sighs of satisfaction on the springy turf under the shade of the fruit trees. The travelling cookers rumble up, and huge cauldrons of stew and potatoes are slung off, carried to the different companies, and served steaming hot to the hungry men. A boon among boons, these same self-cookers, less so perhaps now that the warmer weather is here, but a blessing beyond price in the bitter cold and constant wet of the past winter, when a hot meal served without waiting kept heart in many men and even life itself in some. Their fires were lit before the regiment broke camp this morning, and the dinners have been jolting over the long miles ever since sun-up cooking as comfortably and well as they would in the best-appointed camp or barrack cookhouse. The men eat mightily, then light their pipes and cigarettes and loll at their ease. The trees are masses of clustering pink and white blossom. The grass is carpeted thick with the white of fallen petals and splashed with sunlight and shade. A few slow-moving clouds drift hastily across the blue sky, the big fat bees drone their sleepy song amongst the blossoms. The birds rustle and twitter among the leaves and flit from bough to bough. It would be hard to find a more peaceful picture in any country steeped in the most profound peace. There is not one jarring note, until the honk-honk of a motor is followed by the breathless panting whirr of the engine, and a big car flashes down the road and past, travelling at the topmost of its top speed. There is just time to glimpse the khaki hood and the thick scarlet cross blazing on a white circle, and the car is gone. Empty as it is, it is moving fast, and with luck and a clear road it will be well inside the danger zone at the back door of the trenches in less than twenty minutes. 
In half an hour, perhaps, it will have picked up its full load, and be sliding back smoothly and gently down the cobbled road, swinging carefully now to this side to avoid some scattered bricks, now to that to dodge a shell-hole patched with gravel, driven down as tenderly and gently as it was driven up fiercely and recklessly. Presently there are a few quiet orders, a few minutes stir and movement, a shifting to and fro of khaki against the green, pink, and white, and the companies have fallen in and stand in straight rulered ranks. A pause, a sharp order or two, and the quick staccato of numbering off ripples swiftly down the lines. Another pause, another order, the long ranks blur and melt, harden and halt instantly in a new shape, and evenly and steadily the ranked fours swing off, turn out into the road, and go tramping down between the poplars. There has been no flurry, no hustle, no confusion. The whole thing has moved with the smoothness and precision and effortless ease of a properly adjusted, well-oiled machine, which, after all, is just what the regiment is. The pace is apparently leisurely, or even lazy, but it eats up the miles amazingly, and it can be kept up with the shortest of halts from dawn to dusk. As the miles unwind behind the regiment, the character of the country begins to change. There are fewer women and children to be seen now. There are more roofless buildings, more house fronts gaping doorless and windowless, more walls with ragged rents, and tumbled heaps of brick lying under the yawning black holes. But the grass is still green and the trees thick with foliage, the fields neatly ploughed and tilled and cultivated with here and there a staring notice planted on the edge of a field where the long straight drills are sprinkled with budding green. Crops so do not walk here. Altogether there is little sign of the heavy hand of war upon the country, and such signs as there are remain unobtrusive and wrapped up in springing verdure and bloom and blossom. Even the trapping of war, the fighting machine itself, Where's a holiday, or at most an Easter peace maneuver appearance? A heavy battery has its guns so carefully concealed, so bowered in green, that it is only the presence of the lounging gunners, and close searching looks that reveal a few inches of muzzle peering out toward the hill crest in front. Scattered about behind the guns, covered with beautiful green turf, shadowed by growing trees, are the dwelling places of the gunners deep dugouts with no visible sign of their existence except the square black hole of the doorway. Out in the open, a man sits with a pair of field glasses, sweeping the sky. He is the aeroplane lookout, and at the first sign of a distant speck in the sky or the drone of an engine, he blows shrilly on his whistle. Every man dives to earth or under cover, and remains motionless until the whistle signals all clear again. An enemy aeroplane might drop to within pistol shot and search for an hour, without finding a sign of the battery. When the regiment swerves off the main road and moves down a winding side track over open fields, past tree-encircled farms, and along by thick-leaved hedges, it passes more of these jack-in-the-green concealed batteries, all wear the same look of happy and indolent ease. Near one is a stream and the gunners are bathing in an artificially made pool, plunging and splashing in showers of glistening drops. They are like schoolboys at a picnic. It seems utterly ridiculous to think that they are grim fighting men whose business in life for months past and for months to come is to kill and kill and to be killed themselves if such is the fortune of war. Another battery of field artillery passes on the road. But even here, shorn of their concealing greenery, in all the bare working and ready for business apparel of marching order, there is little to suggest real war. Drivers and gunners are spruce and neat and clean. The horses are slick and well fed and groomed till their skins shine like satin in the sun. The harness is polished and speckless. Bits and stirrup irons and chains and all the scraps of steel and brass twinkle and wink in bright and shining splendor. The ropes of the traces, the last touch of pride in perfection, this surely, are scrubbed and whitened. The whole battery is as spick and span, as complete and immaculate, 
as if it were waiting to walk into the arena at the naval and military tournament. Such scrupulous perfection on active service sounds perhaps unnecessary or even extravagant, but the teams, remember, have been for weeks past luxuriating in comfortable ease miles back in their wagon-line billets, where the horses have done nothing for days on end but feed and grow fat, and the drivers nothing but clean up and look after the teams and harness. If the guns up in the firing line had to shift position, it has meant no more to the teams than a break of the monotony for a day or two, a night or two's marching, and a return to the rear. It is afternoon now, and the regiment is drawing near to the trenches. The slanting sun begins to throw long shadows from the poplars. The open fields are covered with tall grass and hay that moves in long, slow, undulating waves under the gentle breeze that is rising. The sloping light falling on them gives the waves an extraordinary resemblance to the lazy swell on a summer sea. Here and there the fields are splashed with broad bands of vivid color, the blazing scarlet of poppies, the glowing cloth of gold of yellow mustard, the rich, deep, splendid blue of cornflowers. For one or two miles past, the track has been plainly marked by signposts bearing directions to the various trenches and their entrances. Now, at a parting of the main track, a group of guides, men from the regiment being relieved from the trenches, wait the incoming regiment. Company by company, platoon by platoon, the regiment moves off to the appointed places, and by company and platoon, the outcoming regiment gathers up its belongings and moves out. In most parts of the firing line, these changes would only be made after dark, but this section bears the reputation of being a peaceful one, the Germans opposite of being tame, so the reliefs are made in daytime more or less in safety. There has been no serious fighting here for months. Constant sniping and bickering between the forward-firing trenches has, of course, always gone on, but there has been no attack one way or the other, little shell-fire, and few aeroplanes over. The companies that take over the support trenches get varied instructions and advice about tending the plants and flowers around the dugouts and watering the mustard and cress box. They absorb the advice, strip their accoutrements and tunics, roll up their shirt sleeves, and open the throats, fish out soap and towels from their packs, and proceed to the pump to lather and wash copiously. The companies for the forward trench march down interminable communication trenches, distribute themselves along the parapet, and also absorb advice from the outgoing tenants, advice of the positions of enemy snipers, the hours when activity and when peace may be expected, the especially unhealthy spots where a sniper's bullet or a bomb must be watched for, the angles and loopholes that give the best lookout. The trenches are deep and well made parapets solidly constructed. For four days, or six, or as many as the regiment remains in, the range of the men's vision will be the walls of the trench. In the piled sandbags, the inside of their dugouts, and a view, taken in peeps through a loophole or reflected in a periscope mirror, of about fifty to a hundred yards of neutral ground, and the German parapet beyond. The neutral ground is covered with a jungle of coarse grass, edged on both sides with a tangle of barbed wire. Close to the German parapet are a few black, huddled heaps, dead Germans, shot down while out in a working party on the wire at night, and left there to rot, and some killed in their own trench, and tumbled out over the parapet by their own comrades. The drowsy silence is broken at long intervals by a rifle shot. A lark pours out a stream of joyful, thrilling song. A mile or two back from the firing line, a couple of big motor cars swing over the crest of a gentle rise, swoop down into the dip, and halt suddenly. A little group of men with scarlet staff bands on their caps and tabs on their collars climb out of the cars and move off the track into the grass of the hollow. They prod sticks at the ground, stamp on it, dig a heel in, to test its hardness and dryness. The general looks round. 
This is about as low-lying a spot as we have on this part of the front. He says to his chief of staff, If it is dry enough here, it must be dry enough everywhere else. The chief assents, and for a space the group stands looking round the sunlit fields and up at the clear sky. But their thoughts are not of the beauties of the peaceful landscape. The words of the general are the key to all their thoughts. For them the promise of spring is a grim and a sinister thing. To them the springy green turf carpet on the fields means ground fit to bear the weight of teams and guns, dry enough to give firm foothold to the ranks of infantry charging across the death trap of the neutral ground, where clogging wet slippery mud adds to the minutes under the hail of fire, and every minute there in the open means hundreds of lives lost. The hard dry road underfoot means merely that roads are passable for heavy guns and transport. The thick green foliage of the trees is so much cover for guns, and the moving of troops and transport under concealment from air observation. The clear blue sky promises a continuance of fine weather, the final release from the inactivity of the trenches. To these men the promise of spring is the promise of the crescendo of battle and slaughter. The general and his staff are standing in the middle of a wide patch of poppies, spread out in a bright scarlet that matches exactly the red splashes on the brows and throats of the group. They move slowly back toward the cars, and as they walk the red ripples and swirls against their boots and about their knees. One might imagine them wading knee-deep in a river of blood. End of section 6